All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews every Monday and every Friday right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe so you can find out when those interviews are coming up, even though I just told you it's Monday and Friday. Also, if you think you can ask better questions of my guests, go down to the Patreon link in the description, click the appropriate tier, and then you could be asking the questions. Also, uh, you can see these interviews a week or two before they air. Speaking of guests and having great questions, David Fishoff is here today. He is the creator and founder of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. He has had an incredible career as a sports agent and leading up to Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, working with some amazing musicians, reuniting the monkeys, uh, just one of the few things, creating the Ringo Starr All-Star Band. We're going to talk about all those things, and we're going to talk about Rock Camp the movie, which is available right now. You can find it on Apple. You can find it on Amazon. It's a great movie, and we're going to talk all about that and more right after this. All right, please welcome David Fishoff. Hi, Jason. Well, it's been a while, but great to see you, and Hope you're safe and during COVID and like all of us, it's uh, being safe. Yeah, absolutely, David. I'm glad you can join me. And so oh, I wanted to start with the movie and then we'll get into your career a little bit. But so I watched the movie and I was skeptical. I go, oh, my God, this is going to be a rock camp infomercial, you know. Uh, and when you watch the movie, you realize it's not. It's a very well-made movie. And I think it's very inspirational. And I'll be honest with you, I got a little choked up seeing some of the campers um, stories and so we'll talk more about the movie but first tell me how the movie came about who, who, the idea to make it so the idea to make the movie came from jeff rowe um he was a producer and um ran vh1 um vh1 for many years and he approached me with the idea of of you know david why don't you make this into you know tell the story and you know you were right when you hit in the beginning it, it the first few editors turned into an infomercial and um and it wasn't going to go anywhere. And then um, he brought in Doug Blush, who um, did 20 Feet from Stardom. Uh, Eric, I think it's Eric Quest, the, the, the Netflix um, film about uh, uh, the Russian doping. And recently um, he was awarded an Oscar for Period, um, a short film, a doc um, that he that he produced and, and also edited. And Doug Blush came in and he really made the difference. And he took the story. He said, I love what you have here. But I'm going to turn it into a doc, and um, it, and like you said, you know, it is a very emotional. I just got back from Jerusalem, and uh, we showed it to 200 people there at the film festival, and and there were a lot of tears in the eyes. People said, but it's really, I, I, I have to say, after five years of he, you know, it's it's. I love the film. I, I'm really, I'm proud of it. I'm really proud that they, what they've done. Yeah, and so we're gonna have a link in the description so people can check it out. And, you know, it's very affordable to watch on these different sites. I watched it on Vudu, the, the pay-per-view system, and so really easy to get a hold of. And I think one of the great messages of this movie is, and I've always believed this, and I think you do too, it's not about how great a musician you are. And it's also, there's not a wrong way to play music. And the camp really shows that. And when you see Alice Cooper and Gene Simmons very inspirational in the movie, talking about this is your chance to live this dream. And I think the way the world is now, shouldn't we take these chances? You know, it's a bucket list and definitely. And, and you know, at the beginning when, when COVID was, was basically we thought it was over, um, our sales were going through the roof because people realized, you know, I've been cooped up for two years. Here's an opportunity to, to do something I've always wanted to do. And I can only do this at Rock and Roll Fantasy Game. Where else am I going to get to jam with Joe Perry or Roger Daltrey or Gene Simmons and really get to see how amazing these individual musicians are and um, how, how much they give. And um, and then, you know, then all of a sudden Delta hit. But I, I think we're going to be fine. I think it's going to go away in October. I think the world's getting more vaccinated. But, you know, Rock Camp is a, is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And, you know, I just I just love sharing it with people and and changing everyone's life. Yeah. And so we're going to talk a more, bit more about the movie and some of these lives that have changed. But I want to go back to your history because you've got a you've got some life. The first fa fa uh, Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp is 1997. But before that, you're growing up in Hackensack, New Jersey, and uh, you're going to the Catskills like most people at the time were probably doing in the area. 
Yeah. And Catskills. I was a waiter. I was a waiter in the Catskills. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know a lot of people who have uh, at that time period have that story being a waiter at the Catskills. And for those who might not know, the Catskills was sort of upstate New York. And you would have comedians and amazing singers. And that would be a night. That would be a night, you know, and, and you know, Jason, many of the greatest comedians came out of the Catskills because, you know, after people getting three meals a day at places like Grosker's, Concord, Cutcher's, all these great hotels, and they got fed and they got fed. They paid like $100 a day. You had three amazing meals, a pool, shuffleboard. You know, really, it was camp for adults. And then at 1030 night, you, you walked your way, you, you worked your way into the, um, the nightclub. And a singer would come out and do a half hour and from 1030 to 11. And then from 11 to 12, these great comedians like Freddie Roman, Larry Best, uh, David Brenner, you name the comic because they all start in the Catskills, had to entertain these audiences. Now, you got to understand, this is not like when you when you when you do a gig, Jason, and, and people are, um, you know, applauding after every song. These are people looking up to the comic after being stuffed with three meals a day and say, OK, entertain me. I dare you to make me laugh because they don't want to laugh. You know what happens if they laugh? Then the whole three meals are going to come out of them. So they they are sitting there and they're and they're basically saying, you know, I dare you to make me laugh. These comics that came out of the Catskills had to come up with the best shtick and had to be so funny that when they went out to the real world to open for Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck and for all these amazing stars. They really were able to become huge, and 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 they because the, the audience of the Catskills were rough. Yeah, and that was where they, the starting grounds for these people. So yeah, you I have not to, many of them. Hey, you do. So what I find fascinating is that your brother is a musician, and he's playing in a band at the Catskills. You've always been an opportunist, uh, an entrepreneur, and so you decide you're going to play in a band too. You're going to be a bass player. I, you know, he did it. He got all the girls. You know, that, that, I, I like that um, uh, Brett Michaels from P Poison, he he came to camp, and the first thing he told everybody, he says, I learned to play guitar to get chicks. I mean, how many musicians? Joe Walsh even said that to me once. He said that I, was, I wasn't the best-looking guy in high school, but the way to get girls were learn to play guitar. So, you know, naturally, everybody wants to be in a band. Today, more and more people are, are picking up guitars. Women are picking up guitars. Well, and yeah. it's it's it is really incredible. But yes, I wanted to be in a band like my brother, the drummer. And but I, I, I you know what, Jason, I couldn't. I still can't get that F chord. My mm -hmm. fingers don't go over it. I try. I try to be a musician. It, it one, just, one, one gig, right? One gig. One gig, and I was I was terrible. But you were smart enough to see the opportunity in selling the bands, and so that was you, my dad. That was my dad. He was amazing. He's, you know, he says, "Stop trying to be in the band. Sell the bands." Mm -hmm. And and you did, and so you you saw Dr. J, Julius Irving, famous basketball player, and it motivated you to realize that these guys, I could manage these guys, I could make money on these athletes. Right, you know the stars. You know it's you learn one thing in the cat school: stars sell. You know, and it, and so you know you saw Alan King performing, and you saw Tom Jones, and and I saw these ball players, and I said to myself, wow, they don't. You know, I would go collect the money at the bungalow colonies after the performances. I was booking bungalow colonies with comics and singers. And, you know, I'd come in there to this bungalow colony and the owner would say to me, you know, the guy wasn't funny enough. He wasn't funny. I'm taking off $50. And I said, to him, but, 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 but that's my profit. Mm -hmm. I don't care. The singer didn't do a fiddler on the roof tune. I'm taking off $25. So then I decided, you know, I, I, I saw these ball players show up and all the kids go nuts. I said to myself, what am I doing booking comics and singers for and praying to get paid? I'll book these ball players. All they got to do is show up, dunk the ball, sign autographs, and they're heroes. Mm -hmm. And that's when I changed my career to sports. And you were ahead of your time in this as well, because this is before the, the collectible market has it really boomed. And before sports agents. There weren't sports agents. Right. There was myself, Bob Wolf. There were like a handful of people that were representing athletes. And you know, all the clients that I picked up, whether it was Lou Pinella, um, you know, and, and Elliot Maddox, uh, they didn't even have agents, you know, they, they didn't have agents back then. Yeah. So it, it's easy to represent yourself because no one's really doing this. So you can, you have a first crack. Um, Phil Sims is one of your clients, right? Loved him. He was amazing. He, I, I, I represented him after his first year of, um, he was in the NFL. 
he had an agent, was a little unscrupulous then because, you know, it's like the recruiting um, business and, and uh, he got an agent who just didn't do, him, didn't, didn't do the right thing for him. So um, we met and he hired me and it was amazing. It was really life changing because uh, I represented Phil from his first year of football up until his broadcasting career. And, um, you know, he taught me a lot. He taught me how to be a winner. He, he is, uh, that's one thing the sports gave me. It really gave me the, the ability to be around people like Lou Pinella, the Yankees, to be around these people who just want to win, Mark Bavaro, Phil McConkie of the Giants. And, you know, at the same time, you know, it, it, it just, it, it's inspiring to, to be around these athletes who really, um, you know, work out and, and take their, their sport first. Yeah. Did you get Phil Simms the I'm going to Disney World commercial? Yes, I did. That was the first commercial ever. And that was the Super Bowl that I, um, that was the Super Bowl we were in and he was in and I had a lot of those giants and Jim Burton. And, and I remember I went, to, I went to Disney World. I went to, well, the idea came from Michael Eisen's wife. She had that idea to, that the winning quarterback, but the problem was is that um, no one would commit to the winning. So they had to guarantee the money to both Elway and Sims. Um, and whoever would win would, would get the commercial and because uh, no one was going to work on the com. So, um, but Phil won. And, and uh, what a Super Bowl he had that year. And uh, that commercial really was the original um, from the Disney World. I'll tell you something else, Jason, I'll share with you. You know, that giant team, I remember having dinner with them, um, all my clients. I had eight of them on the team. It's 1986 we're talking 1986, about. 1986, yeah. That was the same year I was doing the Monkees. But I remember having dinner with them right before the Super Bowl. And I sat them down and I said, guys, you have the opportunity here to be the face of a lot of different things. And the year before the Chicago Bears with Jim McMahon, they were able to, you know, really do the Chicago shuffle. McMahon wore that headband, Roselle. They were a bunch of characters. And I said, you know, even though the Giants are a very conservative team, you guys have an opportunity to have a point of identity. In show business, you know, as Henny Youngman, take my wife, please, or, or Joan Rivers, can we talk? Everybody had a point of identity to be successful. And I said, I, I really, I, I pointed out to them and I t told Phil McConkie, listen, it's important for you to create something. You know, it's Phil McConkie, uh, the Giants who created that uh, towel waving. No one ever waved a towel um, in a, in, as an athlete. That was him. Jim Burt, he came up with the idea to throw the Gatorade of, over Coach Parcells. No one did that beforehand. So then he jumped into the audience to grab his kid. That team... You know, they they decided to, to do a bunch of firsts that today is is, is part of the game. Yeah, it it, go, it goes with the game. I've got to ask you. So you start as a sports agent. Did you know anything about being a sports agent? No, no, I knew nothing about being a sports agent. You know, Marv Albert says in the film, he said, "What does David know about sports?" But what I did know was I knew how to represent people. And what I would do is I would use, I love sports, by the way, I love it. But, you know, sports is about statistics when you negotiate the contract. So I would use these young students, these college students who were statistic majors to help me negotiate these contracts. And they were amazing because they, they you know, they're big sport, they're, they're more sports oriented than I was. And, and I would win a lot of negotiations for players like Dave Maganan and Randy Myers. Um, I was winning because you're getting them great deals because of arbitration and because I, you know, really t told these guys how to go out and prepare me and I had a great team around me. So um, while I, I love sports, um, but the intri intricacies of sports, I remember Lou Pinella coming to my office and, and I, I asked him to come to my office. I said, Lou, I need your help. I got these contracts negotiated. Give me some insight. And he really sat me down and, and you know, Jason, I, I don't know if you know this, but if you're a sports fan, but I remember negotiating Dave McEnan's contract with the Cubs. And, um, you know, Lou said to me, now, listen, um, you know, the, the, if you look at McEnan's, check out his numbers, how he hits during the day versus at night because the Cubs had no, no lights. Right. Um, so it was all those little things. And and uh, check check to see. When you compare, when you do a sports contract, look at the guys hitting twenty eight home runs versus Maganan's, you know, sixty five ribbies, and you'll see that his sixty five ribbies come when the score is two to two, two to one. He's catching the game up, he's tying it. When the guy is hitting twenty eight home runs, um, you know, he the scores nine to one, so he's making it nine to two, or he's making ten to one. So, statistics in sports and baseball, especially, 
it is really, really important to understand them. Did you feel like it was challenging when you first go in to negotiate? Did people go, who the hell is this guy? You know, it was, you know, who is this guy? He's from the Catskills and, and you know, especially George Young of the Giants and the Pittsburgh Steelers. You know, they, they would come to me, but I was prepared. You know, I came in and I represented the player. I was I was really adamant about that. You know, in those days, the, the agents would get paid off. Uh, I caught a couple of agents getting paid off. Uh, uh, I saw the Rams once paid a a lawyer to get Vince Ferragamo to sign his contract. They they gave him fifty thousand dollars, and I said to myself, you know, why would and Vince was smart enough not to sign the contract? Um, so they would give him season tickets, they would give him gifts, but because I was still booking acts in the Catskills, because I was booking private shows, because I had an entertainment background, um, I was able to be independent from these team owners and these general managers. That I was able to look to get, you know, really focus on the player. So my goal has always been when I was an agent, focus on the player, uh, do what's best for the player. And, and you know, as, as I did when I was, was a music manager too. Yeah. And so when you were, had your sports agency office, you were sharing the the office with music people, right? Music managers. Yeah. So I was, yeah, that's what happened. I was sharing it with, with Shep Gordon, the great manager of Alice Cooper and Teddy Pendergrass at the time. And okay. I remember Ben Verena had an office up there, uh, Meatloaf's uh, Cleveland International, uh, his management company record label was there. And uh, sitting across from me was, was the great Gary Kerfus. And, well, you know, he was really amazing because Gary represented the Talking Heads, the Ramones, Blondie. And I used to see these guys walking in our offices and, and I saw the gold records on the wall. And that's when I decided, you know, I want that. You know, you know how it is. We all want what we don't have. You know, they're looking at me and say, David, you know, you're so cool because you got all the athletes. And, and I'm looking at them and said, you're so cool because you got, you know, Blondie and Joey Ramone. And I want that. So everybody always wants what they, they, they want, so what they can't have. And that's what really led me into the music business. Well, and it, it always seems like your battles through the, the industry, uh, it's because you're fearless. You know, I, I don't think you take no for an answer. And <laughs> so I, 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 I became a sports agent. I'll become a music manager too. Yeah, yeah you know, I, you're right. I, I've always taken chances. You know, my dad's a survivor of the Holocaust. And as you see in the film, and, you know, if, if he, you know, his stories every day, he would tell me and basically, you know, I'm, I'm fearless. So um, if he could survive, I could do it too. And, and I got to tell you, you know, I had to learn along the way, right. but yeah. I made sure to really put my time in to learn and, um, and work hard and, and, uh, and really passion, Jason. If you, if, if you ask me what the common denominator of all these careers I've had, it's passion. I'm not doing something unless I have passion for it. Otherwise yeah. I'd just rather not do it. Yeah, absolutely. And so tell me about the Happy Together Tour, because this is kind of where it begins for you. So it begins to me, I get a call from a band called The, the Association, and they want me to represent them because they re read about Vince Ferragamo um, throughout the headlines in the LA Times. And someone asked me if I was interested in representing the association. They were looking for a manager. And I respond, the association of what? But I, I didn't really know them, but I, I, I remember looking up their music and I heard all their songs in the dentist's office, Cherish, Wendy, Never My Love. So I made a trip to California to meet the band. They started playing me their new music. I said, play me the old music. And when I heard the songs come to life and those vocals, I said, wow, I got the chills. And I took them on and I take them on and I start going to get bookings of William Morris and every agent's looking at me like, what are you doing? You have 35 athletes. You have uh, members of the New York Rangers, the, the Knicks, the, the, the Giants. You have all these great athletes. What is your book? We, we can't get $2,500 for this band. We hardly can book them. Why are you doing this? And I said, well, you know, I want to be in the music business. And I really begged these people to help me. And they did a great job. They booked them throughout the United States. I didn't know anything about Rowdy, Jason. I mean, I can to this day, I, I, um, I booked them from New York on a Thursday night to the Orange County Fair because I thought, wow, you know, it takes three hours uh, to go from New York. You can leave, take a nine o'clock flight and, and get there at 12 o'clock at LAX and drive to Orange County by one o'clock and get on stage at three. Right. I knew nothing about sound check. I knew nothing about, uh, you know, how, how to route a tour. But um, because when I called the band, I said, should we do this? And they said, our, one guy yelled at me. He said, oh, it's our, you're the manager. You have to make those decisions. Well, the end, I, uh, I got him a million dollars in bookings. 
but there was no money left because um, yeah, it all it, went into travel. No, it all went into cocaine to keep the oh. band. Out. <laughs> they needed they they did so many drugs that summer. But what happened was that all these other bands saw how busy the association were. So Gary Puckett's um, his his manager contacted me, and the Turtles contacted me, and Spanky and our gang, and all these bands said, "Wow, who's this guy representing the association, getting them all this work?" So that was the start of me taking these bands on and then packaging them in in the, the first package, Happy Together, 1984. The movie The Big Chill came out, and uh, when The Big Chill came out, you know everybody got into nostalgia music and. Um, and the bands only played hits and uh we had a great show and you know the the promoters around the country really liked it because they, they could buy a show for fifteen thousand dollars at all hits four bands and um and the audiences just loved it and to this day you know howie silverman who worked for me has continued that package and um it still works and people still love it and uh, i'm glad for that yeah that format's bigger than ever the idea that you can put multiple groups on a bill of any style of music and people want to hear the hits. And if no, you know, no one was doing that. No one did. The guy that did it before me was Dick Clark, period. Yeah. Before a festival, before anything, no one was doing it. And then and then what happened was in 1986, as you see in the film, the, the monkeys, that, that's it. That was it. That's, that's the famous picture between having uh, four of the monkeys, the first time ever in 20 years. That's with Bob Rafelson and um, Bert Schneider, the two guys who created um the monkeys for columbia pictures were backstage and at the, the greek theater that was it that was the, that was really what turned my life around and i remember it this is the then and now tour that you put together 1986 the monkeys become so retro the tv show starts playing on mtv every and it's like beatlemania maybe the fans are a little older but people were so excited to see the monkeys together and Probably the average person wasn't looking for it, but you had the sense to get these guys together. H how do you do it? Well, so I had the sense to get them together because I was in 85 the year before I was in a hotel room and I couldn't sleep. And the TV show shows up at two o'clock in the morning. And that was really the only show my parents, you know, would let me watch. Um, because they wouldn't let me watch wrestling. They were afraid I was going to get too wild. But they let me watch the monkeys and I became a huge fan. So I re reached uh, out to Peter Tork. I found out he lived in Manhattan teaching music lessons. So I invited him to come to one of my Happy Together packages. I put him right on the side of the stage and I saw how much he loved it. And he turned to me afterwards and said, boy, we could do this. And I said, well, can you take me to meet uh, Mickey, Davey, Mike? He said, Mike's not going to do it, you know, because he's um, his mother made, you know, invented liquid paper. But he says, you know, if you fly me to England, I'll introduce you to Mickey Dolans and, and, and Davey Jones. So in 85, late 85, I went over to meet them convinced them to go on tour, um, got a hold of Columbia Pictures, got the name, because uh, they don't own the name, the band didn't own the name, Columbia Pictures owned the name, bought the name, and unbeknownst to me, I go on sale, and I'm on the seventh floor, 1775 Broadway. On the eighth and ninth floor is this new fledging network called MTV, and I'm going up and down the elevator with Bob Pittman, who was the president, and uh, and, you know, everyone knew me as a sports agent for the Giants. So, you know, when the Giants lost, people look at me in the elevator like, oh, you know, they lost again. Because the Giants had some horrific years sure. prior to that Super Bowl. And um, I run upstairs to Mr. Pittman and I say, Mr. Pittman, my name is David Fishoff and I'm d doing the Monkees. And I understand that you're doing 24 hours of the Monkees TV show. And he says, sit down, kid. And I sit down and, and he says to me, now listen. Um, you promote MTV and all your music ads, and I'll promote you on television. So I said, well, you got it. And um, I go on sale for the Monkees, and uh, I start going on sale to, to venues like, you know, in Detroit, the Pine Knobs, or, that have 5,000 seats, and they usually do about 3,000 seats of the of my um, Happy Together tour in Chicago, Poplar Creek. I go on sale, and I sell 30,000 tickets in Chicago. Two nights sold out in Detroit. Every little girl came home in the morning and the mothers would yell at them and say, where were you all night? Mommy, I was buying monkey tickets. And the mother would say, whoa, 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 whoa I want to go. The monkeys are back. And so the mothers didn't, no one really realized that it was, a, the young kids didn't realize it was a 20-year-old band. They thought it was the newest band out there. So um, we sold 30, we sold out um, Foxborough Stadium. We sold out San Diego Stadium, stadiums, arenas. 
amphitheaters. It, it, 1986 was it was the hottest year, yeah. and simultaneously the the Giants. I'm representing eight of the New York Giants, and they go to the Super Bowl. So yeah, that you're on top of the world at that point. Top of the world, yeah. So let's talk. Let's move ahead a little bit to Ringo Starr's All Star Band, which is another concept that everybody has started to use. And so somebody like Ringo, you know, he's not uh, John or Paul. He's got less songs. So, well, how about having all stars perform? They perform their songs. Ringo does what he does best. And you got a show. So how does that come about? Well, after I did the Monkees for a few years, I came up with the idea of Dirty Dancing. That was one of my packages also. I created Dirty Dancing as a live arena tour. I had seen the movie and I decided that, you know, the songs and the dances would be an amazing um, experience for people to, to to witness the show live. And I got those rights. And that was also a huge tour for me. I, it sold out Radio City, you know, eight shows overnight. Um, it sold all around the world. Australia, it was, Dirty Dancing was incredible. Germany and Spain, Italy and America. And um, my, my business model was I would really get a cor I would get corporate sponsors to come in and and sponsor these tours. And um, Pepsi, who um, sponsored the, the uh, Dirty Dancing Tour with their brand Mountain Dew, uh, called me and said to me a year later, you know, this was so successful for us. Um, would you come up with the next tour idea and, and we'll, we'll, we'll back you? And that's when I came up with the idea of Ringo Starr and the All-Star Band. Um, my brother Joey was the drummer of the band, as I told you earlier. And um, Ringo was his favorite. So I decided, you know, I'm going to send him an offer and and come up with this idea. And I always had the idea, you know, that song will help my friends. And man, he's a Beatle. You know, how cool would it be to play, you know, with everybody? So I wrote him the letter and I got to see him. And uh, about six, uh, about a month later, I go to England. I go to meet him and I walk into the office and he says, I was thinking the same idea. So it was awesome. And then, uh, you know, we shared ideas for who the all-star band should be and he came up with his friend Joe Walsh and Levon Helm and Rick Danko and you know and I I went after the obvious guys like Billy Preston because of his association but um, he came up with, with a lot of these names and and then we decided we went on tour and uh, boy that clicked that clicked that what an historical tour that was you know to meet meet those amazing people and and to see them all on stage and you know people were scared they 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 said oh it's never gonna work. How could all these people tour in one band, you know, all these egos? And, you know, like Joe Walsh said it best. He said, you know, we're a democratic band. Whatever Ringo says, we do. And so it was it was the respect that they had for him was unbelievable. And they all got along. It was fun. There were no wives except Barbara came on the tour, but Ringo's wife, but no managers, no agents. And myself went, his lawyer, and, and we just really had a, I saw the camaraderie on that stage and and on and, and off the and off, you know in the vans and the buses and and the traveling on the plane and that's when I got the idea. Boy, if I could give this to the fan, um, then we could you know we could, I could create rock and roll fantasy camp and that's really how I came up with the idea. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was sort of you have this fantasy band. Now your idea is well, what if I can have other people involved? And I've got to point out. In, you, you tell this story about Joe Walsh and Levon Helm. I've heard you tell it a few times. It's an amazing story, and we'll get to it. But I also want to point out that who knew there was a video and that we could actually watch it in Rock Camp the movie? That's what makes this story so much more impressive. I've heard you. I said, maybe David's exaggerating a little bit. But when you watch <laughs> this, because you weren't planning to go on the road, they no. told you you're going. And next thing you know, here's a new part of your career. Here's a new part of my career, you know, and they – and you know they had they had to make fun of somebody and they had to joke with somebody while they they were joking and I mortgaged my house to get that tour going. You um, were probably the straightest one there, though. You know what I mean? So I'm you're the straightest go. one there, and they're laughing, they're having fun, and and I'm just you know I'm doing all the logistics and all the business, and as you see in the film, you got to see the film in the film Rock Camp. You see that 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 unfolds. And um, but, you know, it, 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 it was so interesting for me because in the end, I started representing Levon and, and uh, representing Joe. And, and, you know, it took me to the next level. You know, I had to I gave up on the Turtles. I gave up on, you know, a bunch of my bands that I had. And uh, I entered a new dimension of rock and roll. And and, you know, boy, that was it was the greatest lesson I learned. And I learned a lot. Levon Helm and Joe Walsh, 
I mean, that was really an education in, in the music business. Uh, you can't go to school to learn the, no. the, the, learn what, what these people know about the music business. Yeah, for sure. And um, and we'll tease it, but Levon Helm and Joe Walsh decided to have a little fun with you. And they they staged a fight and they staged, uh, they broke a bottle and they had fake blood and the whole... And in the scene, you see how panicked you are trying to separate these two rock legends from fighting who are actually just kind of yeah. kind of practical jokes. I, yeah, I, I saw, saw my house go down the Hudson River, you know, so my mind. <laughs> I, think, I think that describes it pretty well, seeing your reaction. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so listen, you can't have all the fun yourself. you got to bring it to the people. I want to give it to the people. I, you know, I kept telling Ringo, I said, you know, because I, I would get calls from everybody. What's this one like? What's that one like? How are they getting along on the road? I can't believe that Joe Walsh is behaving. I can't believe that this is. And you know, it was a love fest out there. And again, you know, you know, Ringo is such a great role model for all these people. You know, he's not an alcohol. He doesn't drink anymore. And, and you know, he, he's really clean. He's sober. I mean, it, and, and he changed so many of these people's lives. So it was a lot of, like he always says, peace and love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, it's time to prepare for Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. The Ringo Tour goes out every year. It's successful. People love it. Um, and then it's time to bring it to the people, Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Do, baseball Fantasy Camp and Basketball Fantasy Camp, sports was doing this. So, obviously, you were already familiar. We probably booked guys to do fantasy camps. Well, I, I used to do my own camps. You know, Lou Pinella and I, we did Lou Pinella baseball camps. So, I did camps you know, for kids, and I was fam very familiar with it. Um, and I had heard about these other camps, but you know, the difference between the sports camps and the, and, and the, and the music camp is, you know, in, in professional sports, once you're 35, you're never going to be a professional athlete, but in the music business, you know, you can always be a, a musician at 80 years old. I mean, you can write a song at 90, you can, you can perform a bar mitzvah and get paid at 75. So, you know, age is not a limit when it comes to music and, and becoming a professional. So, and I also think the difference between the, the, the rock camp is these, these artists like Joe Walsh and these artists like Roger Daltrey, I mean, they're selling out, um, you know, arenas. The, mm -hmm. the baseball players, they, half of them, most of them can't even hit it out of the fence, out of the, you know, out of the, out of the wall, you know, hit, hit the fence anymore. But, you know, listen, I, even people go to those baseball camps to be able to, to hang with your legends. It's, it's unbelievable. I, but Rock Camp to me is a little different. Rock Camp to me is a place where you can not only hang with your legends, but you can really learn from them and 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 get tips for them on how you can write a song and how you play a song. You know how to play a song, how to be in a band because you know being in a band is is not easy. You know it, it takes a lot. You know you got to learn to listen and the lessons that you can learn from these incredible musicians, really incredible people, and and the fact that they're willing to give back and it's, it's just, it's really powerful, Jason. And one of the things that I find interesting about Fantasy Camp, I got to spend some time around it. I got to see some of the camps with you and some of the artists that I work with. And it is what you make of the experience. And you tell the people that. When you get there, some people might be a fan and they'd like to get some autographs and watch Q&As and maybe try a little something. And you always make the point. You don't have to be, you can play the triangle if you need to, whatever it is to be part of it. You're welcomed. People don't make fun of you. It's not uh, everyone. No, not at all. And, you know, listen, people are scared to come. Right. Um, and that's really one of the reasons I wanted the film to be made because I wanted to get that fear away from people um, because, and, and the great thing about Rock Camp is that once you sign up, let's say the Scorpions are coming, you, we're going to send you songs to learn if you're in a beginner band, if you're an intermediate band, if you're an advanced band. We have a musical director, Britt Lightning, um, she really prepares the uh, she prepared each musician who comes with what songs to learn, what to study. And so that by the time you come to camp, you're going to be as prepared. Now, you will be nervous because you're going to be put in a band. You're not sure if you're good as not good as. But it doesn't really I want to take away all that nervousness away. So um, what we're doing now is we're doing master classes. You can meet your band in advance and we want to prep you because, you know, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And um, and so and then once they come to camp, they're able to take what they've learned in those four intense days and take it back home and join a band, write songs, 
you know, just become a better musician. Because as you know, Jason, one of the things I learned was when you play with better people, you become a better musician. Absolutely. I started playing music much later in my life. As a kid, I wanted to play. But <clears throat> as I got older and found people that I worked with who were inspiring, and I took a chance, played 100 shows before the lockdown. And uh, so you're never too old to try it and to have that experience, like you said. And when you go to these camps, everyone has a different thing they bring to it. And Gene Simmons, you know, he gets a lot of slack for being a business character, but he might be one of the best instructors I've ever seen. He he's, works he's amazing. so close. His ego that everyone thinks is the biggest is out the door. He really works with these people and gives them advice that sound advice, which is we're going to write an original song. Sure, we can jam on Kiss songs, but I'm going to show you what it takes to write a song and how to get an idea. And he's teaching people how to count measures by biting an apple every measure. I mean, and I think people are inspired by it. Gene's a teacher. And I think it's so interesting because he comes off so great in the film. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, you know, people are surprised. They're surprised by him. They're surprised by Paul Stanley. Uh, just how amazing, how giving these people are. And, you know, with Gene, I, I, I get it, you know, because he said to me, he said, I wish they had this when I was first starting out. I would have saved myself millions of dollars of mistakes that I made. And I would have people to ask the questions. But back then, you know, just like the Beatles, you know, um, you know, who knew not to sell your publishing? Who knew not to do that? They, they, they were, they, you know, they were the forefront of, of rock and roll. So I, I think what you have is you, you see in the film really how, how, give, how, how much Jeff Beck gives back, how much Nancy Wilson gives back. And, you know, they're at a stage where they don't, their egos are, hey, I want to help these people. I was one of them. I just got lucky. So what can I do to help? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it is, yeah, the movie does show that. And you do get the idea of, uh, you know, what you're going to get to do. Now, look at this here. <laughs> Rolling Stones. Rock and roll fantasy camp on The Simpsons. I feel like when you began this idea in 1997, it started to take off. All the news shows were talking about it. It was a, you didn't have a hard time getting press. No. Then this episode, The Simpsons, comes out, and suddenly Rock and roll fantasy camp is the centerpiece of this episode. So it's a whole episode. It's one of the top 10 episodes on The Simpsons. And that happened because I hired Leslie West. To, um, to do the camp, and Leslie was a guest on Howard Stern, and uh, they were talking about Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. The producers were listening to Howard Stern, and they came up, they listened to him talk about it. They go into a production meeting that day, and they said, hey, you know what, we got the idea for the last episode of the season, or the, or the opening season, is going to be, let's, let's send Homer to Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. So one of the, the producers calls up, um, Setzer, Brian Setzer, because his daughter is dating his son and says, hey, would you be in this episode? Homer goes to Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. He says, oh, I'd love to do it. And then they call a couple of Lenny Kravitz and he said, well, I would love to do it. Next day from that first day of that production meeting, they get a phone call from the Stones. The publicist calls up and says, you know, the Rolling Stones are going out this summer. Would you have an idea to do a Simpsons episode? And they said, well, how about getting Mick and Keith go to Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp? So they call back the next day and said they both love the idea. They're going to do it. So they had already hired Brian Setzer. They already hired Lenny Kravitz. They already hired Tom Petty. But they added them all in. And uh, it was really an amazing episode. And basically gave tremendous awareness to Rock Camp. They opened it the, the first night of our camp. Um, yeah, that was amazing. Um, so many of these shows, whether for Ellen or Bones or so, Saturday Live, you know, even if they made fun of us, it was okay as long as they mentioned us. Yeah, you knew that any press was good press. Yep. And this, you know, you've had a lot of ideas. This one seems to be taking off very fast. I know it starts small and it starts to grow, but uh, you had you knew you had the goods. What, was, it, was it difficult to get the, the mark for Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp? Were there other people angling for it or was it just out there? No, no. When I first started, no one was doing it. So I was able to get the mark. Um, that's number one. But And I had to prove that I use it and... And but Jason, this was a very hard business, you know. I mean, it didn't. We didn't put that in the film because no one was interested in, you know, how tough it was. But you know, if we're, we're here on this on your show, I'll, I'll share with you. I, I, it was rough for many years, and I'll tell you why. Number one, um, people are scared to come. So I have a guy like Jeff Beck, and 
there's no, he's the greatest guitar player in the world, no doubt. And people are scared to come. And, you know, I'm not going to jam with Jeff Beck and look like a fool. I'm not going to be in a band and look like a fool. And so that that's that's my first issue I had. And then second issue is, unlike Coachella or unlike a Ringo Star Tour, where, you know, if Ringo can do 5,000 seats, you just put, a, put him in a bigger venue. You can move it to Radio City Music Hall, you, you know, or, or Coachella. They can move the fence back to let more people in. I'm only limited to a certain amount of bands and, and you can only put like one bass player in a band, well, you know, one drummer in a band. So, it, it, you know, you're limited to who can come and how many people can come. And, you know, as, as you see in the film, Sammy Hagar says, and Roger Daltrey, they both say this is the hardest work I have to do to sing with 12, 13 bands. So it, it gets, you know, it's, it's not a great business, but in the end um, you're changing people's lives and and the film really helped um, people realize what we are. And um, so I'm hoping now that, um, you know, once we get through COVID, that it will turn into be a great business. And, you know, we could tour this thing one nighters. And um, but it, it's a lot of work. It's it's the hardest thing I've had to do uh, everything I've ever done uh, in my career. But I cannot tell you the personal satisfaction when you open your email every day and you see people saying, thank you, you've changed my life. You've given me this opportunity. And and again, you see it in the film. And we could have done a thousand stories. These right. few people that they chose are great, but there are a thousand stories of how the campus changed people's lives. There's and a young man in the movie. His name is Jackson Keller. And uh, he was born with uh, some brain damage. And his father is a camper at the fantasy camp. And yeah. as Jackson's growing up, one of his dreams is to play bass at the uh, fantasy camp. And he signed up to come to come to Dave Mustaine camp with his family, and they're going to be a band. And uh, he's Jackson's story is amazing. He's playing keyboards now. He's playing bass. He's really found the love of music. His father's an incredible human being, and um, you see it in the film. And and uh, yeah, no, that this story is touching. Yeah, it, it it's very difficult. You're probably not human if you watch this story and aren't touched by it. Right. And then the, the other people as well on their journey towards music. Some of these people are successful in their life, but they are getting their 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 fill being a musician. And you see the other people who now have go and perform. How great is that? You leave yep. fantasy camp and you go. You know what? I got I got to drive. I'm going to play in a bar band and love right. my gear. I got to, hey, Jason, you know what? One of my favorite lines at camp, you know, and I, again, I'm not a musician, but I learned so much from these campers. You know, this past year during COVID, uh, Britt Lightning from Vixen, she hosted 160 master classes um, that we have on our site. And we're going to go back and doing it too, because the knowledge that, you know, these these artists have is it's just incredible. But um, I, I have to tell you, one of my favorite um, times at camp was, you know, when Joe Perry came to camp and, um, he you know, was doing a QA. and a and, you know, Joe wants to talk to these people. He really wants to give off. He's such a give, again, a, a giving person. And, and, um, he says to a guy, so what do you do for a living? And I says, well, I'm a lawyer and on weekends I play guitar in my band. And he says to the guy, you know, you're, you're full of crap. He says, you're a musician first. You do that legal bullshit to pay for your guitars. And the guy smiled and he said, yeah, yeah, that's me. And so, you know, as you know, a musician is a musician first. So, um and and you know god bless them because they you have to work hard to be a musician yeah absolutely and you'll hear people say nowadays because touring is done on fly dates on weekends you hear people say i get paid to sit in the airports i would play music for free you know <laughs> i just i just got off the phone with brit lightning from, from vixen two minutes before the, we we were you we, when i went on the air she's sitting in detroit airport she did a gig last night at Summerfest. she's on her way back to new hampshire and um, she's sitting in the airport for three hours. And I'm looking, I'm saying, her, why? He said, David, there's no direct flights. I said, now I know why you travel. You get paid, you get paid to travel. You do the gig for free. And she said, yes, yes, that's exactly so true. It's so true. 45 minutes and be on four connecting, something crazy and sit in airports. But people love music and, and the movie shows that, it, it, that they, they still have it and that the people come here and they get it. Like I said, Rock Camp is what they want to make of it. The people are accessible. And so you can ask what you want to ask. Kids are learning on YouTube. And the problem that I find, and it's great that they have that, but until you play with a live drummer behind you, you have no idea what playing music is about. 
and learning what do two guitar players do together? Well, one plays this part. And at the camp, you can sit there and spend all your time doing that. And so I think that's one of the great things about it. And I think the movie, you know, really shows that. I've right. got to ask you, so I got to ask you, who was the hardest person to get to do the camp? Well, you know, listen, it, it, it started from day one. You know, it was really hard. It was hard to get anyone. Um, and um, so, you know, it's always been it's been difficult. I mean, first of all, when I first started this, this camp, no one ever did a meet and greet. You know, those the, those meet and greets came way after. So right. these people would never meet with these artists. Um, Roger Daltrey, um, I went over to see him and um, and I really tried to explain him the concept and, you know, and it took him a while to, to get it because he didn't understand the word camp. The word camp in England is different than the word camp is here, going to Catskills. But when he got it, he turned to me and says, if you can introduce me to Levon Helm, I'll do your camp. And um, so Roger got it. And once I got Roger, um, it start, started, you know, help me. He got me Brian Wilson. And then once I got um, Steven Tyler, I got, you know, that's when I got Slash afterwards. or I got Slash beforehand. But I will have to say that, you know, it's really hard to get the musicians. Now with the film, it's been a lot much easier. I think what happens is, is that now the musicians have shared with everybody else how much they get out of it, how cool it is. And you know, I'm excited. You know, I mean, I'm getting so many great new ones this year. Kim Thale from Soundgarden. I mean, I'm a huge fan of that band. And, and you know, to get Kim to come to camp and, you know, he's going to do it in President's Day weekend. Jerry Cantrell is coming back for his third time. I mean, it's, un, uh, you know, he's a guy who, who I couldn't get the, for the first, for many years. Uh, I couldn't get Nancy Wilson. She's done four camps. Um, so it's really incredible, you know, getting them. Yes, I have to work hard together. But once they come and they see how amazing the experience is, not only for the campers, but for themselves, then, you know, they come back. And um, that's been the blessing. And uh, so I'm really excited going into these upcoming camps. Dave Mustaine, what a superstar. I mean, this, this guy's selling out arenas now. He's got the hottest metal tour, and he comes to Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. And, you know, it's just you see in the film, he's just he's just such a giving guy. And, um, yeah, and it's music. It's not me. It's these musicians seeing themselves, what it takes to be a musician, and respecting these people that come and say, we're not here to intimidate you. We want to help you get to your dream. We've gotten to – we've climbed the mountain. We know what it's like. Now we want to try to help you. And I believe um, Roger Daltrey donates uh, a portion, if not all, of his money to his charity. Roger gives all his money to his charity. Styx did a, uh, a, a, a an event this year where they um, they did a master class. They gave the money to the crew. Um, Scorpions gave the money to the crew. Um, again, uh, you can – yes, I have to pay rock stars to come to Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. they got managers. they got lawyers. they got agents. they got publicists. They have overhead. But I don't cannot believe that any one of them, any one of them is coming for the money. They're coming – because they're getting something out of it as these people are getting out of them. And, and, um, and so it's really beautiful. It, it, right. To me, it's, it, it's, it's wonderful to see these artists who, you know, for many years, you know, used to hear about rock stars and people put them down and, and, you know, whether it was the government and, you know, whoever it was, you know, and, and you can learn so much. I mean, I, so many stories Jason didn't make the film. Like I said, we could have done a thousand stories, but one of the ones stands out that didn't make the film was a woman who came to camp. She had breast cancer and I invited her as my guest uh, through the Susan Coleman foundation. And, and um, she comes to camp, goes through the entire experience. Meatloaf is the instructor. He's the main guest. She's the vocalist. She leaves camp. She writes a book called rocking the pink. Her name is Lauren Rowe. She, I call her up. I said, can you come just do an interview for the film? And, uh, she comes, and then I asked her afterwards uh, through the, the, the interview, I said, ask her what it was like when she left camp. Because, you know, you take these people on such a high. You give them such an experience, and then they have to go back to their office. And I said, what did it do for you? And uh, she said, you know, how did you go home? She said, you know, David, she said, I went home, and I made a promise to myself. I was never going to write another legal brief again. I was going to go with my passion. I am gonna be, I, I'm going to become a writer. And that's what my passion was. Yes, I want. You know, I'm in a band. I write songs, but I, I, I knew that I, I could. Um, I wanted to be a writer, 
and I never went back into an office again. I took what I learned from these artists who come to your camp, and they're authentic, and they're real. And let's face it, in order to be, um, whether it's Kip Winger, whether it's to be Gary Hoey, whether it's, whether it be any of these musicians, Lita Ford, they had a chance, they had an opportunity in life, and they could have gone for a real job or go for their passion and their drive. And and they went for their passion, their drive. And you can learn so much from these people that because they're so authentic. On the other hand, you can learn a lot from Gene Simmons and Roger Daltrey and about uh, business. Look at Aerosmith. They, they're around for 50 years together. How many companies are around for 50 years and just sold their sold their rights for millions upon millions of dollars? You know, they've kept together. They've gone through their ups and downs. But as a band, they stayed together and their brand and they're selling out nightly in Vegas, they're selling 50,000 people in Europe. You can learn a lot from rock stars. And um, I think that, you know, over the years, people never believed it. Parents didn't believe it. Government didn't believe it. But when you see the authenticity of these people in their beliefs, man, there's so much to learn. And I've learned so much from them all. Well, and that's a big part of the fantasy camp, too. If you want to learn the business end of it, these people have been burned. They can tell you what to do and what not to do. You learn the technical end of it. Maybe you're new and you don't know the difference between a monitor and a speaker. And there's yeah. so much going on that if you're watching and you're paying attention and you you will you learn what you want to learn. You learn what you want to learn. We have master classes. We have a lot of jam rooms. You know, I, I love that Jerry Kencho walked into the last camp. He, he sits himself down at a table and has lunch with these people. I mean, God, it was just unbelievable. And and just to see them mixing and mingling, and I, I just love it. I just, uh, you know, and, you know, whether it's profitable or not profitable, it is such a great feeling that you know you're doing God's work and you're doing it through the power of music. Yeah. Now, David, I got two questions, and then we're going to get into plugging uh, some upcoming camps. You okay. got a book, you got a movie, we got stuff to talk about. But I got to ask you, and I'm sure you're not going to name names, but was there ever someone you uh, – a guest you had that was a little bit difficult or maybe did not get the fantasy camp idea? Yeah. Yeah. P P Peter Tork of the monkeys. You know, Peter was a good friend, called me up. He says, I want to do your camp. Uh, you know, I'm in program. I, I, I'm a big fan and I want to give back and I like it. And I said, Peter, it's a lot of work. You know, you got to really be, you know, you have to really give your, give yourself, you know, and he said, no, I'm going to do it. I really want to do it. And he came to camp and, you know, uh, I'll never forget the guy from the London Times. He came to K asked me the same question, Jason. Mm -hmm. And he said, who's the most difficult person? I said, Peter Tork. And then I saw Peter about three weeks later after the article comes down. He says, why did you say I was the most difficult person? I said, you were, Peter. I said, it was really hard because, you know, people signed up for your, your camp and you got to, they're going to ask you questions you might not like. They're going to ask you for an autograph. They're going to ask you for a photo. They're going to ask you. And, and you know, you have to love people and, and love the fans and love these musicians. So, you know, I've had so Peter was difficult, and I love Peter Tork. I mean, we were very close, and as you see in the film, but it takes a certain personality. Not everybody can 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 do this, and um, so and I have I've had a few, you know, lead singers of bands, and I got the LSD, the lead singer disease, who who just weren't great mentors, not great teachers. You know, musicians really work better for me. So, um, but that's really it. Uh, and then a camper wise, I think I had to throw out one person in all 25 years. You know, a guy came yeah. in. Yeah, I had to throw out a camper who, who thought that he was better than everybody else and um, and he was obnoxious. And uh, But no, most of the people are just, they're just amazing, great people. And, and again, you know, you're spending a lot of money. You're, you you want to come prepared. And, and um, so, but no, P yeah, Peter was with that. What was the other question? I forgot. Well, no, I didn't, I didn't give it to you. So the other question is, who is the biggest person that you want to get for the camp, but you just haven't been able to do it? I get that all the time. And, and you know, while Mick and Keith are two of my favorites and they, they, they did the Simpsons for me, I guess the, the, the real person I would, I would do anything for, give my left arm, my right arm. But I'm a big Paul McCartney fan because, you know, and there's no question that you know, what he's achieved is, is musical genius. Um, that would be great. And uh, Eric Clapton's another great one. Um, Jimmy Page is another great one. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's never over. It's never over, you know. Yeah, I'm sure you've reached out, right? What? I'm sure well, you've reached out. I'm not, yeah, I'm, you know me. I'm not ashamed. I, I went to Eric Clapton's lawyer and I said, listen, you can raise a million dollars 
I guarantee you I will get 100 people to spend $10,000 to write a check to your charity for because he gives his money to charity. For, for his, um, you know, I'll get 100 people to pay, pay. I don't want to make a penny. But if I can give that dream to people to jam, do licks with you, um, you know, because you know, he produces those shows for, uh, you know, um, Crossroads and, and uh, you know, a lot of expenses there, renting the arenas. Here, come, just do it. So I, I would do the same thing to Jimmy Page. So I'm hoping one day they'll do it. I would do it for charity. I would do it for Roger Daltrey's charity uh, mm -hmm. for Teenage Cancer America. But uh, And I think people would love that opportunity and that dream to, to be able to jam with Paul McCartney. Yeah, absolutely. I, let's hope that happens. Okay, let's look at some of these fantasy camps that are coming up right here. This is the next one, right? That's the next one. Uh, now, uh, I don't know where you, you're missing one tile because um, coming to that camp is um, the drummer from Nico McBrain from Iron Maiden. I don't know Iron where you Maiden, know. Okay. Yeah, so he's not on there, but that's going to be a camp. We moved that camp now to, to Jan, the first weekend in January, January 6, 7, 8, 9. Nico McBrain, Richie Faulkner, great guy, comes to a lot of our camps. Steve Morris is such a giving, giving person. He's going to jam with the with the campers in the final night and uh, live on stage to Hard Rock. Let's see the next one. Uh, yeah, and then we got da we've got Dave Mustaine, uh, obviously. Oh. We got sure, and of course Billy Sheehan and Vinny Apice. Oh, just the, the, the councils. Listen, the councils are really what make the camp. They are the whole. They hold the building up. You know, you get four days with. You know, four days with Britt and and with Vinny Apice and 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 Billy Sheehan and you know you know you end up coming for uh, the big names because you want the photo. You also want to hear what they have to say and you want to jam with them. But the councils are the, are the meat and potatoes of rock and roll fantasy game. I've got Carmine a piece on the show tomorrow. And uh, do you do you know the story about Vinny Apice? Making having his mother make lasagna for John Lennon. I make him tell that story at every camp. I am the biggest. Yeah. Vinny Apice is probably you see we I, we featured him in the film. He's such a special individual. Um, there's he he does every camp. I, I he's my first call. Him, Rudy Sarzo, my first calls. They're they're amazing, and uh, I'm a huge fan. His brother, boy, that, that you know, what a drummer, what a what a drummer. Uh, he, you know, he was spinning drumsticks in 1968 on the Ed Sullivan Show. Nobody. He, let me tell you something. He's a they're super talented family. Great, great people. Great, great people. And that story, yeah, you have to have Vinny tell that story because it's it's really fun. Well, I want to find out if his mother ever got the lasagna pan back. That's right, the, exactly. Okay, so then uh, January 27th and the 30th, we had you had a camp in Los Angeles. This is a great idea. This is for women only. And oh I, wow! Excited about that. You know, Brit Lightning. She's our musical director now at camp, and she's the one who puts it, all the music together now, prepares the campers, prepares the counselors. Britt came to me with this idea about a year ago, and you know, she, and it was really her idea. And you know, we reached out to uh, Melissa Etheridge, and I, Melissa, what a sweetheart. She saw the film, and um, they all did. And you know, I can't tell you that. You know, the, what a talent lineup for that. And, you know, it's only 70, 80 people, and you're going to get to spend time with them. And we're getting so such a great response. That, that camp is going to sell out. If you're a female and you're a musician, um, vocal spots, I think, are basically sold out. So, But if you're a drummer, you're a bass player, play keyboards, horns, whatever you play, you do not want to miss this experience. It's Grammy weekend. Kathy Valentine from the Go-Go's, Rock and oh. Roll Famers. Nancy Wilson, Orianthe, who's another amazing talent. What a talent. You know, Orianthe, she, I'll never forget, she, I sent her the, 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 all about the camp. She called me right away. She says, you know, I don't care about the money. I'll give it to my crew. I love this idea, and I'm getting them all. They're all just loving that. And, and you know, in this today's world, you know, uh, I know women are going to be free. Lori Majerski from XM Radio just signed on as the hostess. And, you know, I, I think for women to come to that, and have an opportunity to, you know, to, to be able to jam with other women. It's, it's going to be incredible. I think. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna, say it again. I'm going to say hi and leave. Yeah, I think that uh, I think women are tired of men mansplaining things to them yeah. and treating them as if they're not equals when there's some such amazing talented women. Oh, so and many, I think so many. And, and I have I think, a council lineup. I mean, Britt put together Roxy, the drummer, and and um, you know Jeff Beck's. Uh, a drummer and oh, the music, you know, the pink space player and 
Well, yeah, Jennifer Jeff- Batten. Jennifer Batten, Michael Jackson's yeah. guitar player. Yeah, Jennifer Batten is coming. I mean, it, it's it's going to be something. It's going to be something. And, and you get to play the whiskey, which is amazing. I, you know, I saw right. the Judas Priest camp at the whiskey. And how amazing. You got the uh, Rudy and Carlos from Choir Riot, Sebastian Bach singing. You got the members of Judas Priest on stage. At Jason, the- is that amazing night that you were able to witness Judas Priest at the Whiskey of Go-Go? And Rob Halford gets off stage and says, David, let's do this around the world. He is unbelievable. You know, yes. and I, believe me, I'm not here to suck up these rock stars. If, if, if you know, when, I, when, when they suck, I'll tell you they suck. But I'm telling you, when they're great, Rob Halford, boy, he, I, I'm I'm one of his idols. You know, he's one of my idols because I'm not one of his idols. I, 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 he, I idolize that guy because he's so giving and he's so talented, and you know, he doesn't need to do this, and he just realizes that, wow, I can make a difference in this world, and you know, and besides music, so it's a very yeah. special person. Absolutely, there's so much opportunity with these camps. Um, when I played the whiskey for the first time, I looked around at Soundcheck and I said, you know, this is where the door started. This is where every band has played. My hero. Blue. I mean, Van Halen. It's just, you know, you're on that big stage and, you know, the place smells just like it did 40 years ago. But, yes. uh, you know, a lot hasn't changed. But no. what an opportunity for these people. And now you're on stage playing with someone from Judas Priest uh, or Melissa Etheridge. Or it, it, it's pretty crazy. It's incredible. How about this? I thought that was was exciting about that camp was um, was um, Sebastian Bach saying this is my fantasy to be on stage with Rob Alford. You know, I I asked Sebastian, would you come that night? And he said, of course, I'll be there. You know, that's my fantasy. You know, you get a guy like Sebastian Bach who's passionate yeah. about music. He's passionate about these artists. You know, I mean, he he he's met Roger Daltrey for the first time on a cruise. I mean, he loves music. He loves what he does, and and you know, and he, and, and these people can't believe. Wow, Sebastian Bach is passionate. Yeah, he's passionate. You know, so so you know, while you're going home and you're a dentist and you're a lawyer and you're working in an office and you know, you can learn the passion from the these artists. Yeah, absolutely. He's a biggest fan as it comes, and you can see how authentic that is. We're going to put up the images of some of these camps, but I want to also mention March 10th to the 13th, which is uh, 2022. We've got a camp in Florida, Tico Torres, Bon Jovi, Joe Perry from Aerosmith, Vernon Reed from Living Color, and those are the headliners, but you still have amazing people like Billy Sheehan, Tony Franklin, Vinnie Appice. It, the, these get better and better. Then Las Vegas, I don't want to forget Las Vegas, my hometown, March 31st through April 3rd. Scorpions are back in town for the residency. So you got Rudolf Schenker, Matthias Jabs, Sebastian Bach, who lives here as well. You got Queensryche. And so uh, this one is March 31st to April 3rd. What value? I mean, where can you to sit and hang out with all these people and, and oh, the Scorpions? I mean, they, they came alive with me during my, during my, uh, during COVID and when they did master classes. And, um, Boy, I love those guys, and 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 their music is just worldwide. And they came on board, and you know, here here they they did their master class, and they donated the money to their crew. I mean, that you know, yeah. this is passion. These artists, um, you can really learn learn so much from. And it took many years for people to learn how great they they really are. Yeah, I I had the honor uh, that you gave me of judging one of the uh, the final night competitions. I had Eddie Trunk uh, with me. Yeah, and, and he, boy, does he take it serious. There's not, there's nothing. Uh, everybody, everybody takes it serious, yeah. and you know, I don't do that anymore. Where, because to me, everyone's a winner. But, yeah, you know, I had Eddie there, and I think Sammy Hagar was the guest, and uh, really, uh, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eddie's a cra- oh, another guy. Passion, passion, passion. He's kept alive all this music. You know, he's his interviews, his promotion of this. And, you know, there's no, uh, he, he's a huge contributor to the success of this music today. Absolutely. And I tell people that, uh, you know, because people are so picky. I don't like this guy. I don't like that guy. If it wasn't for that guy, you wouldn't have as, as many of these shows and you wouldn't have that kind of music. Um, and he is a great guy on top of that. Yeah, on top of it. And he's a huge giant fan too, Jason. Yeah, so believe me, yeah. <laughs> and the Mets though, I'm a Yankees fan, so we don't okay. always agree. Yeah, we don't agree on that one. David, let's talk a little bit about your book because you have figured out not to just turn Fantasy Camp into something for fans, 
but a great thing for businesses too. You run these leadership events where people can come from a company and have this dream of being a rock star for the day. And it seems to be a great corporate uh, bonding thing. It's a great bonding thing. And it's bonding through music. And again, you know, as you know, as what I've learned from being in a band um, is learn to listen. And um, the CEO of um, Oracle came to my camp and uh, a gentleman named Ed Oates. And after he did his first camp, he said, you know, you don't realize this is amazing team building. I mean, I learned to listen. I learned how to run a company. Um, and there's so much you can learn by being in a band. And that's really why I do these corporate events, because I wanted to I, I'm trying to convince co corporate America to be a band, to, to learn to listen to the, the every department has to learn to um, to, to work with each other. Uh, one of my favorite lines I remember learning from Mickey Dolan's and the Monkeys. You know, he taught me. He said, "David, everyone is a partner." He says, "When I walked into that reception at Rhino Records, that lady is a partner in my career." And I use that all the time. Everybody who works for these artists, whether it's the road manager, whether it's the tour, the driver, whether it's the crew guy, uh, they're all partners to help build the the business. So. Um, you can learn a lot. And I wrote this book uh, a few years back because I really, again, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent that people should see how amazing these rock stars, that they're not just, you know, rockers, but that their their personalities are and what they have to offer. And, you know, again, what the business you can learn from the Beatles, the business you can learn from the Rolling Stones, Bon Jovi, uh, Kiss, you go on down that list and you see how they've survived years and years of, of the music business and they're bigger than ever and making more money than ever and selling more tickets and selling more downloads. And so I wanted to share the success that these people have and how you could take that with your business and, and uh, hope people you know learn a lot from it. Yeah, and I've seen these events. It's fun to see people working together who see yeah. each other at their office all day. Now they're breaking up into bands and putting and on collaborating, right? They're collaborating on songs. They're learning team building. You know, they're, 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 they're coming up with the name of their band and it's in a fun environment. It's a fun, fun environment. It's different than, you know, climbing ropes courses and, you know, through the, again, uh, power of music. I, 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 just, I cannot emphasize how powerful music is. And, you know, it, yes, it's powerful for the fan to go see a live show, but the offshoot of it is just unbelievable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that is the dream from a lot of people to be a musician. And so for one day, if you get to do it, if you get to go to rock camp, you get to do it for four or five days. Um, this is rock camp, the movie. I want to make sure people. Thank you. Yeah. Out. Yeah. It's, uh, so you can, the book is in the description, but also rock camp, the movie, which is available on Apple and Amazon. It's an easy watch. It's actually a lot of fun. I really got into it. You get to see some of your heroes, but the, the, and so it's, it's a great mix of what the experience is about, and then a little bit more about David's life that we spoke about, but also to see these individual people become stronger with music and uh, and what some people overcome to make this happen. Yeah, I mean, again, it, 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 what you can learn, what you can learn and what you see. And, you know, I tell these artists, you know, when these managers give me telephone numbers to, to appear, I said, we're not a concert. We are teaching the power of music. And Jason, we have a book coming out um, in November, the 25th anniversary of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. Um, that's going to tell the story, um, and it's going to be available. Um, and it's 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 great. It's, it's interviews with the counselors, interviews with the stars and the campers together, um, of one volume. Yeah, that sounds great because there is no normal day at Rock uh, Camp. <laughs> yeah, everything is a surprise. Yeah, everything is a surprise. I um, miss you. I don't see you in Vegas, but we're coming back. We'll be there with the Scorpions. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you uh, next year, and uh, we, we hope that everything stays safe. It was great that in the time when lockdown was happening, you had the master classes so people could still interact. Sebastian Bach was teaching people how to sing in his living room. It, it, at least you kept that experience alive, so we had something. Jason Flom, a president of a record label, I mean, his, his master class was unbelievable, teaching people you know how to get record deals. Alice Cooper teaching them about you know his knowledge and I'll tell you what was exciting about that and I have to give Britt Lightning again a lot of credit because here was an event where normally these artists are here look so I'm promoting my film today I want everyone to buy the film I want them to come to camps but all these people that that were interviewed were, were did it because there was nothing to promote we're home for COVID we might never perform again let me give you 
Let me answer your questions and give you the best information we can to help accelerate your career. And uh, the, from Roger, on, Roger Dolce on down, the information that came out of these artists, uh, Desmond Child, the, the uh, you know he he was so great, the songwriter that I'm going to do a, a songwriting fantasy camp with him. So yeah, what, a great, what a great what a great idea! I think because there's so many people, and so maybe you're not inclined as a musician, but maybe you want to be a songwriter. Yeah. Maybe you be in management. Why not, why not learn from the best? Why not learn from the best? Yeah, absolutely, David. I really appreciate you spending some time with me. I look forward to seeing you again. It's great what you're doing. We want to remind everyone. Rock Camp, the movie, it is available now. Apple, Amazon, Voodoo, do a search. It's real easy to find. And thank you so much. Jason, you're so welcome, really. I really enjoyed it. Good to connect. <laughs>